Welcome everybody to the Space Commercialization Track Collider. I am so excited to have you all here today. Um, I'm excited to be joined by some awesome speakers. I'm excited for this community to get to know um, our founders uh, and to get to know a little bit more about the program. Um, if I have not met you before, my name is John Nordby. I'm the Managing Director for Mass Challenge Texas, uh, where I get the pleasure and the honor to lead our accelerators in Austin and Houston uh, and our track work for space uh, and sports here out of Houston as well. Um, so, um, give you a little sense of what you can expect for today. Um, on the agenda, we are going to kick off with some uh, with a quick intro uh, from our friends at NASA, in particular, our great friend Vanessa White, uh, Director for Johnson Space Center. Uh, we have a few startup intros after that. Um, we have a great talk by Megan uh, Crawford from the Space Fund, a few more um, introductions from our startups. Uh, and then um, our friend Steven Gonzalez from Sodor Capital, we'll have a quick conversation with him, a few more introductions from the startups, uh, and then we'll go into breakout rooms afterwards. So we hope to keep this pretty fast paced, pretty lively. Um, there's a lot of content coming at you. The introductions are going to be quick um, and they're designed not to be a full pitch by any means, but just to give you a sense of what our founders are working on. And then we'll have the breakout rooms open um, at the end of the program for you to go in and meet them to connect a little bit more, to learn a little bit more um, and to hopefully connect more afterwards. Um, so. Without further ado, to kick us off, I would love to hand it over to our friend Vanessa White, Director of Johnson Space Center. Vanessa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this today. And hello to uh, everyone uh, via Zoom. So I am uh, Vanessa White, Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. And I'm really excited to be here um, at JSC. We are dedicated uh, to being a part of enabling the uh, commercial space industry and doing our part to make that happen. And we're excited to do that here in Texas with several community partners, including Mass Challenge. Uh, so congratulations to each and every one of you for being a part of this. Um, through the partnerships, uh, we're solving critical challenges and uh, that's gonna enable us to do deep space exploration uh, by making the resources of our center available to startups and uh, further developing the commercialization of space. So my background, uh, I have a NASA logo and I have the Artemis logo. And uh, Artemis is the program that we are working on to take us uh, to the moon again. And this time we will do it a little differently than before. Uh, this time we will have women that will be a part of the program. Uh, when we went during Apollo, we only had men go, but now uh, as many of you, I see that are startups. Uh, we have more uh, women and people of color in the workforce. So uh, with our uh, new program, we'll be able to do that and we'll be exploring the moon on our way to Mars. And so as uh, we have lots of technology challenges to solve to be able to do that. Uh, I think that Houston, is going to be the center for commercialization of space. Uh, I believe that you know we have all of the ingredients right here to be able to do that. Uh, we have the hub of human spaceflight here. We have the International Space Station, which we've had humans on orbit for almost 21 years now. Uh, so technology-wise, um, we have been uh, working on um, deep space exploration for many years using the International Space Station as a test bed. And for your companies, you know, maybe an opportunity that many of you would want to fly your technologies on the International Space Station or other platforms that we're currently working towards having on what we call low Earth orbit. So that's near home. Uh, and the reason that we want to do that here, because we can get to the International Space Station in about four to six hours, and we can also return in that time frame. When we go to the moon, it's going to take us uh, about you know three to four days and returning. But when we go deeper into space, going to Mars, it's going to take months to do that. So. Right now, we have the opportunity to do uh, testing of technologies at what I say near home uh, on the space station and encourage you to be a part of that. So I'm excited um, that uh, to welcome you to the Mass Challenge Space Commercialization Track Collider. Uh, my understanding is this marks about the halfway point of the Mass Challenge Early Stage Accelerator and one of the first opportunities to meet the founders. So that's what John was talking about. Uh, as a part of the spatial commercialization track for 2021. Uh, so my understanding is this year, Mass Challenge took in over 3,300 applications 
for Early Stage Accelerator and welcomed 231 startups to participate and 36 startups were then selected to participate in the space commercialization track. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, as I do know, you know, competition is, uh, is, is fierce. Uh, and um, one of the things when I, when I was looking at this, that we were calling this a, a collision, for us in space, we try to avoid collisions, but <laughs> in this scenario, it makes sense. And so today, um, you know, wanting you to take advantage of having the opportunity to have these collisions to make connections. And um, if when we do open back up again as a center, uh, John, when we were off, uh, mentioned having come to the Johnson Space Center and been able to tour and learn more, I would like you to welcome all of you uh, to come down and visit us so that we can actually collide in person. So with that, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, uh, awesome way to start us off with. Can't I can't wait to get back out to JSC myself. I'm always so impressed at all the, the hidden buildings. I've, I've joked with Stephen for years that at some point, y'all are going to show me the hidden room that's got the aliens in it. I don't know if you keep it here or in New Mexico or I don't know. I'm not going to speculate, but I know it's somewhere. We're going to get that out of you eventually. Um, all right. No, thank you so much. We're, we're so excited um, that not only to have the space commercialization track here in Houston as sort of our home base for it as we support startups around the world, uh, but to now be able to do it uh, officially in partnership with Johnson Space and you all have been such a wonderful partner to us. So thank you, Vanessa, for uh, making that available to us, your team, your facilities, your um, and just your leadership in that. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for the partnership. Bye now. Okay. All right. So a um, couple minutes on what we're doing here, um, what the space commercialization track is for those of you that are joining us um, that are part of our expert community uh, or investor community. Um, I'll give you just a quick background on, um, on why these founders are awesome uh, and why we love this program. Uh, so here at Mass Challenge, we, we are really on a mission to equip bold entrepreneurs to disrupt, disrupt the status quo and create meaningful global change. Um, we do that uh, in a number of ways. Um, most uh, noticeable to the general public is we, um, we run our early stage accelerator every year. So as Vanessa mentioned, we took in 3,300 applications this year to our early stage accelerator. We accepted 231 of those uh, startups. Uh, and of those 231, 36 um, were accepted into the space commercialization track, which means they had an application for space, which we'll talk about in a second. It's a very selective program. Um, and as an organization, we're a nonprofit that doesn't take any equity. We don't charge the founders anything. Um, we, we are able to accelerate them at a, at a uh, meaningful pace and, and offer the service because of experts and volunteers that, that give us their time, their effort, their energy. So uh, that's also a plug. If you're not an expert for us or a mentor, we make it very easy for you. If you would like to, I'm happy to uh, help you figure that out. Um, through our programs, or through our early stage accelerator programs, we, we look at a bunch of different components and there's a few things that um, we try to build into everything, which is education, connection and support. Um, so our expert community spans the globe. It's about 14,000 people across the world. Uh, they opt in for any one of our programs at any given time. Um, we have a vast partner network um, that uh, extends not just to our sponsors and our sort of more traditional partners, but um, through our communities that represent capital and knowledge and, and access across the world. Uh, and then we work to support our founders Founders, both in program uh, and our alumni um, in a number of different ways um, through, through that programming and, and other things that follow on. Uh, more specific to the tracks that we run then the space commercialization being one of them, we have a subset of our community of experts that are dedicated to that track, um, some curated content and expertise, much like we're running today, uh, and then a, a specialized peer network of alumni and um, startups that and founders um, that are currently navigating similar journeys as the folks that are in our um, in our space commercialization track today. Um, you know, one other point that I'll make here um, is that there's very specific things that we're looking for in our space commercialization track, and, and some of them you'll see here on the screen, right? Things that affect human health and performance, um, energy storage, robotics. It's a really, really a long list. The challenges that face us as we think about um, uh, uh, trying to get to Mars, um, deep space exploration, commercializing low Earth orbit, they really encompass just about every technology that's out there, uh, minus a very small subset of them. Uh, so what's been fascinating about doing this work over the last couple of years is, you know, we, we launched the space commercialization track last year in Houston, 
partially because of the expertise that we had access to here, uh, but also because of the uh, uh, the amount of dual use technologies that we saw. So many startups came to us not knowing um, or, or maybe not thinking of space as maybe their initial uh, industry or their initial um, uh, space to gain traction, uh, but very much had a technology or an application that was a very clear fit for some of our partners. Uh, and then vice versa, we, we would see a lot of companies that would come to us that were, um, you know, wanted to be in Houston for access to the space industry and, and also realize that they had a dual use with some of our partners in defense or energy. Uh, so it's been just an incredible um, experience to see these companies come up together and to offer another pathway for them to grow and then to develop. Um, so um, that's what we're doing here at Mass Challenge. Uh, that is the uh, sort of nutshell of our programs, as well as the tracks. Uh, in the breakout rooms later, I will be in one as well if you have any questions about the program itself uh, or you want any insight tips on who you should be talking to. Hint, it's all of them. Talk to all of them. But um, I will be there to answer any questions. Um, and then again, a special thank you to NASA Johnson Space Center. We completed a space act agreement with them earlier this year um, that brought them on board as an official advisor to our program, um, which allows us access to, um, again, their people, not just Vanessa and her great remarks uh, and her leadership, um, but folks across the organization at JSC um, who are mentors, who are experts for us, um, as well as um, access to some of their facilities for testing. Um, anybody that has questions about what that is or encompasses, I'm happy to talk about as well. But thank you to JSC for, uh, for that partnership. All right. Uh, Y'all want to meet some founders? Is that a thing we're doing today? Yeah. All right, cool. Let's do that. All right. So <clears throat> here's how this is going to work. Um, we are going to put um, uh, the founder slide up, the startup slide up. Um, we're going to put the, the list, the order in the chat. So you'll know who's coming up next for this section. Um, the startups only have about 30 seconds to introduce themselves and we're gonna flip the slide to the next one. Um, so everybody's gonna get about 30 seconds or so to introduce themselves. This is intended to be a quick introduction, not a long pitch. So um, hopefully for those of you that are here to meet the founders, take some notes. You can also look at the Airtable link, which uh, we just put in the chat as well. That's got a bit more information on the founders. You can search, you can filter on that. So probably handy to have that pulled up as well. Um, but it'll be a quick intro. Um, they'll pass the mic to the next startup. We'll just kind of go in order based on what's on the chat here. And then we'll come back for our first uh, content session um, with uh, Megan Crawford in just a few minutes. Um, so I will, let's, let, let's see if the startups can do this. Let's see if we can do this, right? Let's see if we can keep ourselves to 30 seconds. What do you say? All right, let's put the first one up, Selena. Let's see where we're at. Acoustic and bio, Lauren. Hi, thanks, John. Hi, I'm Lauren, uh, founder of Acoustica Bio. Uh, we are an advanced manufacturing company and we're solving the greatest challenges in microfluidics, uh, fluid dispensing, and 3D printing. So our proprietary technology, it enables precise drop generation at the micro scale of virtually any fluid. So that can be from resins to honey and it doesn't require uh, solvents, additives, high temperatures, and we can even handle biological cargo like stem cells and antibodies. So hope to talk to you in the breakout room. Thank you so much. Hi, Agile Focus Designs automates real-time microscopic inspection of mechanical and electronic components and biological samples. Since we provide 100 times faster focusing in Zoom than traditional technology, without any mechanical movement of the sample or lenses, we can easily track moving targets, such as weightless targets and dynamic processes. For instance, we can provide a real-time monitoring solution to aid current investigations into biofilm buildup in space station fluid lines. And if you're playing the Zoom bingo drinking game at home, that's our first, I didn't realize I was on mute. All right, that's cool. You still got you still got time. Go ahead, Ray. Thank you. This is sensor. This is dumb sensor. Uh, there is one in your toaster, ten in your cell phone, thirty in your car, three hundred in your house, thirty thousand in the plane, and three hundred billion in the world today. Uh, Forty billion was produced in the last year alone, um, and all of them are dumb. We make them smart with our no code and low code platform with the compiler. A couple of things that are important to space. One is electricity, the other one is internet. We work without both of these. We make these sensors smart with the running on battery, sometimes for months, and without access to 
internet. Come talk to me in the open room. Thank you. And, um, and Alotom has under Air Force SBIR contracts developed uh, hardware sensor technology and AI based diagnostic software. The sensors include corrosion rate sensors. Uh, they are micro sized and fit in inaccessible areas. We have in tech transition in applications on airplanes and helicopters. But now we also have noticed that the sensors, corrosion sensors, have been installed on spacecraft, in particular the Orion spacecraft, and we're looking for opportunities there. The AI software also includes automated vision inspection using deep learning and smart manufacturing, and there's a prime contractor in space that wants to automate vision inspection in spacecraft manufacturing. But the problem there is to deal with very reflective surfaces, which we can address. Thank you. Uh, I'm the next company on Marcoscope. Ever stay up late all night, feeling really, really tired around three or four in the morning, and then feeling better a couple hours later? That's your circadian clock at work, making it so that you feel an incredible urge to sleep and also get really bad at things during those hours. The good news is that most of us on earth know when these extra stupid hours are gonna happen, but what's three to four in the morning for somebody in space? Well, our algorithms have the answer. I hope you stop by my breakout room to learn more. Hi, my name is Sabria. I'm the CEO of Astrolux Corporation. Astrolux is a semiconductor startup. I think we lost Supriya. Let's let's move to the next and then we'll come back if she can reconnect. Okay. Hi, I'm Katie Cam. I'm CEO and co-founder of BioBQ. We're a cultured meat company where we uh, grow meat from cells, cultured, and, and not from slaughtered animals. Uh, we see cultured meat as a win-win solution for providing meat to those that like the taste of meat without having to be concerned about environmental uh, or animal welfare impacts. Um, uh, it's a more efficient process, and we believe our technology is needed for people on Earth and for those traveling in space. So I look forward to meeting with y'all. Hello, I'm Chris Nolans. I'm co-founder of Cybrick. We're a project intelligence system. It's a we're a cloud-based AI platform purpose-built to support engineering and construction projects. We are delivering change by using our expertise in project management by harnessing the power of AI and process automation to create new a new toolkit to transform how engineering and projects and construction projects are delivered. Hi, my name is Diego. I'm CEO and co-founder of DRB, innovative startup spin-off of the Politecnico di Milano in Italy. We develop hardware and software technologies for drones mission automation, especially for industrial inspections, logistics, and human mobility. Uh, we leverage our patented localization device, which is very precise and reliable, and we deliver state-of-art uh, proprietary AI software. So with DRB, you know where, where is your drone and why, why it is there and see you then in the booth. Thanks. All right, and just before we bring up Megan, I think we got Supriya back. Did you, were you able to reconnect Supriya? Yes, hi, I'm really sorry about that. Um, uh, my name is Supriya, I'm the CEO of Astrolux Corporation. Astrolux is a semiconductor startup manufacturing chips, which are seven nanometers and smaller. We're interesting, we're interested in, um, paving the foundation for electronics manufacture in space. We launched our payload on the International Space Station in 2019 from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And um, this payload uses extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun to pattern integrated circuit chips um, to allow astronauts and, and future generations of technologies to have a, an electronics uh, production platform in space. 
thank you for listening and please feel free to uh, contact me if you would like to be um, part of the next phase of the electronics manufacturing um, effort. Thank you. Awesome. Well done. I'm glad we got you back, Supriya. Well done to our first Thank you, Rob. group. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. So um, hopefully you found some someone there that you want to talk to, you want to, uh, you want to visit. Um, again, the Airtable link is in the chat. Uh, for those of you actually that are watching this recording later um, that are not joining us live, that Airtable link will also live with the recording uh, and me or my team are very happy to help you to connect to any of the startups that you see here that, um, uh, that we can help you connect with. Um, all right. So let's bring up our good friend. Megan Crawford. First off, Megan, thank you for joining us in a very busy week. Uh, Megan's joining us from, I'm going to butcher the name, uh, Major Space Conference in Colorado, though. Uh, so thank you for being here. She's joining us remotely, and we have our slides, and I believe Selena is going to run for you, but Megan has been a great friend of Mass Challenge since we launched the Space Commercialization Track uh, last year. Um, the Space Fund, where she, is, um, uh, where she is at currently, has a wealth of data on the space industry and the investments that go into it. I highly recommend you check out their Site. We love, love, love the content that you all produce. Um, I'm not going to read everything that's on the intro slide here because you can see it all. Um, I would rather spend more time uh, giving the floor to Megan. So Megan, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, John, for excellent introduction. Um, I am attending the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs along with 7,000 other folks here. So it's fascinating to see how this industry is growing and to see so much activity. Um, and so uh, I have, I'm dealing with poor internet connection. So I am on my phone, uh, like, like Supriya. Um, hopefully we won't have any technical issues, um, but let's go ahead and get started. And thank you so much to Celine for, for running my slides for me <laughs> due to the technical difficulties of trying to travel and do presentations in this brand new Zoom world that we live in. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today just for a few minutes about the state of new space. Um, we like to talk about the revolution that has occurred um, is so far. Uh, we, we have experienced a revolution and the next step is that evolution of the industry as it matures. Next slide, please. And so, um, oh, let's go ahead and skip, skip right ahead um, to the next one. There we go. So everybody I'm sure remembers this. This is cool, right? <laughs> Tesla in space. Um, this was a stunt, obviously, that, that Elon and SpaceX did. But if this is possible, what is next? Next slide, please. So it's really not about space. It's about Earth. Most of the data that we, are, in fact, all of the data that we get right now from climate change is coming from space. And by moving all of the heavy industry, the mining and the climate harmful processes off world, which is the Jerry O'Neill vision that Jeff Bezos has adopted, we can protect the earth. Imagine a future 10 or 15 or 20 years from now where the entire planet is effectively designated as a national park. We're not strip mining our planet anymore. We're not producing uh, horrible chemicals that we're putting into the atmosphere. And so that's the future that we're building towards. And that's the, the motivation, I think, behind what a lot of us are doing here in this industry. Next slide, please. So the problem is for, the, for all of human history, we have been trapped on this planet. And what, how do we get off? How do we make that future a reality? Next slide, please. So it starts with the space technology revolution. And this is based on Moore's law. I just heard a lot of companies talking about chips and processors, right? All of the things that are making that possible, this great revolution in compute is what has allowed the small sat revolution to occur. These tiny little one U CubeSats couldn't exist without those advanced chips that keep getting smaller and smaller. So thank you Moore's Law, thank you computer industry for completely revolutionizing space and allowing the small sat revolution to occur. Next slide, please. So what's next? We are going back to the moon and not just the Americans, but the entire world. Um, the Chinese, the European Space Agency. This is a great picture of the Bereshit lander from Israel shortly before it had a um, not so nice landing on the moon. Uh, but 
this is building an entirely new economy in space, what, we're, what we refer to as the cis lunar economy, where the earth moon system and everything in between become a single economic force. Next slide, please. Ah, so this is the Blue Origin Lunar Lander. Um, and right now, Jeff Bezos is putting a billion dollars a year of his own money into uh, uh, that Amazon money, right? <laughs> into Blue Origin. And that's just one company and one billionaire. Next slide, please. So there are three important keys to the opening of the frontier. If we wanna break out of this locked system that we're in here on the planet, there's three keys to doing that. Regulation, governments need to lead, follow, or get out of the way, right? Um, and we're seeing this happen, both from a regulatory perspective and from a financial support perspective. We're seeing the United States governments and the European governments put more and more money into the space startup ecosystem, uh, whether this is through grants, whether this is through direct uh, purchasing opportunities as customers. And we're seeing new regulatory work. Um, asteroid mining is now legal in multiple countries around the world. Um, most people didn't realize that it wasn't legal before, but you know, so the governments are really stepping up to help make this revolution occur. Utilization, asteroid mining now being legal means that we can go and actually use the resources of space. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's so important um, in a few slides then. And transportation, cheap, reliable, regular transportation to space. If you think back to the last time humanity opened a, a great frontier, it was the opening of the American West. The railroads have been built. We can get there now cheaply, reliably, and regularly. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned asteroid mining becoming legal. The U.S. Space Resources Law of 2015, the U.S. Space Frontier Act of 2018, Luxembourg's national space policy, the UAE's national space policy, and more recently, the Artemis Accords, which are bringing together all of the countries of the world uh, to agree on rules of the road, norms for how we're gonna operate together on the moon. So this is that great kind of regulatory framework that is, um, that is the backbone of this revolution. Next slide, please. Um, the use of space resources, okay. You, it is always important to utilize your local resources. Why ship things back and forth when you have the resources you need right where you are? Um, and so the space itself is a resource that oftentimes people don't talk about. Um, the, the chip manufacturers on this call will understand the importance of um, low temperatures and a vacuum-based environment for manufacturing chips very expensive and requires a lot of energy to create those environments here on earth when that's just the way space is. It's a natural vacuum with very low temperatures. So there's all kinds of possibilities here for utilizing space itself as a resource. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, click a couple of times for me here. Let's get the arrows up. Okay, so using those resources where you are. Again, the opening of the American West. This is, this is the rocket ship <laughs> uh, of that day, right? And these are the engines, the horses. Um, and what do they use for propellant? Grass, right? And so you're using the resources along the way to propel your, your transportation mode. This is the type of thinking that we need if we're going to be successful at settling the frontier. Next slide, please. This is what that future might look like. Uh, many, many moons ago, I was chief operating officer at Deep Space Industries, and which was an asteroid mining firm. And this was their vision for the future, manufacturing rotating space habitats directly from the resources of the asteroid that you're mining. Um, so this is that frontier mentality that we're trying to, trying to seed at Space Fund and trying to seed throughout the industry. Next slide, please. The low cost, regular, reliable space flight. All right, so for a long time, Elon's been getting a lot of press, right? And now we've got Bezos and Branson in the mix and many more companies coming down the pike. Space Fund is currently tracking 163 launch companies around the world. Most people know about three, right? SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin. 
there are 163 of these companies making huge strides every day in the transportation side of this industry. Next slide, please. Ah, so here's a great quote from uh, the legendary Robert Heinlein. A hundred miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. The reason launch is so important is because it takes as much energy to get to low earth orbit as it does to get from low earth orbit to Pluto. So once you're in orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system. And that's just stunning. Next slide, please. So these reusable rocket ships, this slide on the left was probably um, probably one of the most exciting moments for me in the last few years. I actually teared up when it happened, when SpaceX launched their Falcon Heavy and then nailed the landing of those double boosters. It was just absolutely stunning. This reusability is what's going to allow um, this, this space revolution to occur. Imagine if you had to throw away an airplane after every use. Imagine those trains that opened the American West if you had to throw the entire locomotive away <laughs> after every time you used it. That's not sustainable. These reusable rocket ships are what have really changed the game. Next slide, please. Ah, there's the video. Oh, I forgot I had the video in here. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. <laughs> so exciting for me. Um, yeah, that was just the perfect moment. All right, next slide, please. So this is what's causing that breakout, right? We're no longer locked on this planet. The cage has been broken free. So what are we gonna do about it? Next slide, please. So this return to the moon, there's a lot of really cool graphics going on, a lot of really cool excitement, but NASA has contracted with either four or five companies now, I can't even keep track for these CLIPS missions, the commercial lunar payload services. And after that comes the human landing system. And the great thing is NASA is not trying to do this all itself the way they did in the 60s. They are contracting with commercial companies to do this, which means those commercial companies will now have this capability for commercial missions as well, not just for NASA. Next slide, please. Then on to Mars. Um, now, I have to tell you, I'm a venture capitalist. My current fund, my fund two, has a 10 year lifetime, like most funds. So I don't believe the settlement of Mars is going to happen within the lifetime of my fund. But I do believe technologies that are being developed now will help with that settlement of Mars. Um, maybe in my fund three or my fund four, um, we'll, we'll start to see um, the settlement of Mars become a real part of what we talk about with the space ecosystem. Next slide, please. So this is the real, these are the real revolutionaries, right? It's the children who are in middle school or elementary school today that are going to be the ones setting foot on Mars. And so this is the crowd, no offense to you guys, <laughs> you guys are a little old, but this is the crowd that I really want to get inspired about space. This is the crowd that needs to be um, interested in STEM and learning rocket science from an early age. Next slide, please. So you can invest in people, you can invest in the planet, you can invest in the frontier and help them all. A lot of people think, why are we going to space? Why are we going up there when we have so many problems down here? Well, the reality is investing in the frontier solves problems here on earth. Like many of the companies that you're hearing from today that have a technology that um, maybe was, was originally designed for space and is now being commercialized here on earth. As I mentioned, most of the data that we have about climate change comes from space. So many technologies invented by NASA and space companies are changing our everyday lives. Everything from you know the uh, the original sus you know the usual suspects you hear about Velcro and Tang, um, all the way down to being able to grow food in a healthier and easier way here on space based on experiments that were done on space station. I recently was a moderator at a panel for the uh, national. ISS R&D conference, um, the national lab that CASIS runs on the ISS. One of the panelists, uh, uh, one of my panelists is literally curing cancer based on cellular experiments being done on station. So space helps everyone. Next slide, please. 
So let's talk a little bit more about the data and the numbers. In John's intro, he mentioned that uh, we have a lot of data on our website. Um, there is a lot that we publish publicly. And as you might imagine, there's even more that we kind of, uh, we, we keep uh, a little closer to the cl closer to the chest. But let's talk about uh, kind of the, the dollars and cents of it all, if you will, the numbers, which as, as a VC, I am, I am data driven. I do like my spreadsheets. Next slide, please. Oh, keep going, we'll do one more. So these are a little bit older numbers. I haven't taken the time to update these slides, I'm sorry. But in 2018, the global space economy was at 360 billion. Um, and so the um, right now we're closer to about a $400 billion industry in um, the 2020 numbers. I'm not sure if they've come out yet or not, but I think we're right about that 400 billion number. Next slide, please. What's really interesting to me is this brown part of the chart here. This is the government budgets. Government budget still accounts for 25% of the global space industry. Now there was a time 60 years ago when it was 100% of the global space industry, uh, but 25% is still a pretty significant number. So startups out there do not underestimate. I heard somebody mention that they have an, uh, an Air Force SBIR, do not underestimate the importance of the government customer throughout the life cycle of your startup. Next slide, please. So what's really interesting to me is this tiny little green sliver here, launch at 6.2 billion, according to these numbers that are admittedly a little old, is less than 2% of the industry. It's the part of the industry that gets the most press. It's flashy, it's exciting. I mean, come on, you light one end of it, goes to space, it's a big candle, it's flashy, it's exciting, but it's less than 2% of the overall industry. So what else is going on? What are all these other exciting things? Next slide, please. So space investment. This is obviously where I spend a lot of my time. Um, 5.7 billion was invested in 135 startups in 2019. And in 2020 and 2021, despite the global pandemic, these numbers continue to climb. Um, next slide, please. So of that, uh, the investment of the last five years, 52% of it has gone to just two companies, SpaceX and OneWeb. What we're starting to see in, in the last year or so is a big diversification of that. Of course, uh, SpaceX is the behemoth. Um, they are still raising the largest amounts of capital in the industry, but we're starting to see the numbers really start to balance as it becomes a focus not so much on launch, but on what's being launched. Next slide, please. So types of venture investment since, 20, since 2000. You'll notice this, this kind of teal bar here that's venture capital didn't exist for a very, very long time. And the fact that it's continuing to grow shows that there is serious investor interest in this industry as it's starting to grow and mature. Next slide, please. And I told you we'd be going through them really quick, Celine. Thank you <laughs> for your help. Um, U.S. versus non-U.S. companies receiving funding. This one is fascinating to me. I started tracking space startups around the world in 2008 when there were maybe a couple of dozen. I'm now tracking over 2,500 space startups around the world. It used to be that almost all of those startups were in the U.S. Now it's down to about 60% of those startups being in the U.S., and the US space startup ecosystem continues to grow at a very rapid pace. But what this tells us is that the rest of the world is finally starting to catch up with the new space ecosystem. We're seeing hot spots in Australia and New Zealand, Singapore, Tokyo, uh, Luxembourg, UAE. And we're even now starting to see some very interesting activity in Africa and South America. In fact, in my portfolio, we have two Argentinian founders in our portfolio. We're starting to see more and more exciting activity around the world. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, the fact that the industry has been able to continue to fundraise during the global pandemic, we did some research at the beginning of the pandemic to, to kind of prove something that I think a lot of us in the industry had thought, but there had not been any data about. And that is that space is not correlated to the wider global markets. 
a lot of this has to do with that 25% of the industry being government that I showed at the, you know earlier in the presentation. But a lot of it is because space is just generally not correlated. Space will continue to grow. And in fact, during the 2008, 2009 economic downturn, the space industry continued to grow at 7% per year while the rest of the world, um, you know, all the markets tanked. Next slide, please. Okay, so key takeaways here. I know I'm going pretty fast. We only had a, a short amount of time. I wanted to make sure and kind of throw everything at you guys. So approximately 25% of the space industry comes from government budgets, which provides stability even in uncertain times. The launch sector has received most of the startup funding to date, creating that frequent, reliable access to space. Now's the time to invest in those companies that are enabled by launch. Like I said, it's not about launch now, it's about what's being launched. And at a macro level, the space economy is not correlated to the wider global market. Next slide. So space fund, tell you a little bit about us and who we do. I'm not trying to, uh, to um, be too, too much on the marketing side here, but I figured it might be relevant to the space startups in the room to learn about uh, the space fund. Um, so our vision is to open space to everyone and let anyone who shares in the risk also share in the profit. Next slide, please. So we helped start the new space revolution. My co-founder, Rick Tomlinson and I have been doing this for quite some time. I don't wanna age myself too much, um, but Rick is in fact the one who invented the term new space. Um, in a press release he wrote for the Space Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit that we're both involved in um, many, many years ago. Um, and we're still actively making it happen. We get in, we get dirty, uh, we get our hands dirty. I'm currently sitting on the board of directors of eight different companies and a board observer writes on another 10 or so. And so we don't do the set it and forget it model of a lot of venture capitalists. We are actively involved um, and, and we do our best to improve the value of our portfolio by, by sharing our history, our successes, our failures and helping our startups learn from, from that. And we know who is doing what, how and where. We track the industry very, very closely. Um, John mentioned the data on our, our website. Um, we're going through every one of, oh, I think I have a slide about this. I'll wait, next slide. <laughs> so our deal flow pipeline, we're tracking over 2000 space startups around the world. Um, we have done our reality ratings, which we'll talk more about in a moment, um, um, over 400 companies. We've reviewed 500 deals in the year since our first fund closed, um, and we've made 19 investments now. Next slide, please. So this is the fund one portfolio. Uh, fund two is still developing, but we did get 14 companies into the fund one portfolio. And you'll see they range across the industry. So um, we are space fund, which means we don't do aerospace. We don't do drones. We don't do electric airplanes. Uh, for us, it has to be above the Carmen line to be interesting. And so uh, with one notable exception here, that's space perspective. Um, so, uh, this portfolio runs the gamut across the industry. We look at hardware companies, we look at software companies, and we have a unique capability to do due diligence across the market. Next slide, please. So our reality ratings. Um, so what we're doing is we're going through each of our sectors of interest, sector by sector, and cataloging every company that exists in those sectors. And then based on um, all the information and data that we can gather, and some cursory due diligence, we rate those companies on how real, how quote unquote real they are. Um, in this industry, we find there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of founders with a slick PowerPoint and a fast talking uh, CEO that don't really have much there. And so we want, you know, we wanted to provide some credibility to this industry by, by pointing out the companies that are real the companies that really have it together. They have the right technology that actually works. It doesn't purport to break any laws of physics, let's say. Uh, they have the right team to pull this together and they have the right market timing. So those are our three primary gating factors in creating these reality ratings. Next slide, please. So here are our sectors of interest. Um, you can find these on our website. The black buttons have uh, reality rating databases that are available for you to review, download, play with, 
Um, that data is public and free to use as you're doing your market research for your startup. Uh, this can be a very, very valuable tool. Next slide, please. We also have some special databases um, on exits of startup companies, which as you are planning for your exit, um, until the recent SPAC craze of this year, the majority of those exits were M&A. So start thinking about the aerospace prime contractors that might be a good acquisition and target for you. Um, and this database gives you a good idea of who those people are and, and what they're doing and what they're interested in. Uh, we also, a couple of years ago now for the 50th anniversary of the uh, Apollo landing, put together a database of all of the companies that are a part of this return to the moon. Next slide. We also have some white papers that we've published, including a critical look at the launch industry, which as I mentioned, uh, those 163 launch companies, we don't think there's any way that all of them can survive. And if you wanna understand our, um, our data and analytics behind that, this can be a very fun paper to read for, for uh, those launch nerds out there. Um, and also we're very interested in the intersection of uh, cryptocurrency and, and uh, cryptography cryptographic technologies, excuse me, and how they, those can help fund and run uh, what we're doing in the frontier. So this is a white paper about security tokens specifically and their use in helping fund the space frontier. Next slide, please. Oh, and also that's all available on the website, spacefund.com. Uh, here's my name, title, email address. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, probably not going to respond this week as I'm in <laughs> Colorado Springs for the Space Symposium, uh, but always happy to learn more about what you're doing. And um, if you have any information that can help me with my reality ratings databases um, or just kind of general questions about the industry, I am always happy to help uh, the Mass Challenge cohort. So I don't know how I did on my timing if I got in under my 20 minutes there, guys, but uh, that's all I've got. You did awesome. The content is all that matters. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks for joining us too remotely, working through some of the technical stuff. Um, it, it's always a delight to have you and it's it's so much good, good stuff. Um, and, and I will plug your website again because I, I, I go there often for the white papers, for the data. It is, it, it's a great source. One of the only ones I know in the space industry that's that robust. Thank you. That was amazing. Thanks, Megan. All right. Uh, we Thanks are getting- Thanks for having me. Thanks. All right, we're going to get to the next group of startups. Uh, just like before, we'll put the list. There it is in the chat. The Airtable is linked in the chat again also. Um, I think y'all know what to do at this point, so I can shut the hell up and, and, and let you do this thing. Uh, let's see here. Let's go. Ellen, take us away. All right, thanks. So XM has developed a new tool for rapid high sensitivity materials characterization. What this means is you can take any solid, maybe a rock, maybe a piece of metal, and get the full periodic table of what's inside it in a matter of minutes. Our technology is a new mass spectrometer, and traditionally, these instruments are expensive. They require half a lab's worth of equipment and a PhD analytical chemist in order to get meaningful results. What we're doing is democratizing mass spectrometry for the average user and bringing it outside of a traditional lab environment, potentially into space. Hi, um, I'm Dan Cohen of Flight Material Sciences, and space-borne materials need to perform in extreme temperatures, radiation, and other conditions for long missions, and the coatings used on Earth simply don't survive. So flight applies new surface engineering techniques that are enhance or replace the coatings. The result is a permanent texture that improves any material's interaction with liquids, heat, light, or radiation. So flight is looking for collaborators to demonstrate our abilities like enhanced solar glass, black body treatments, uh, sterilized living spaces, and better heat evacuation without any extra weight or energy. So we're asking for your hardest material challenges at any scale. Thank you. Hi, at Kisma Technologies, we are developing a safe, long-lasting uh, residual disinfectant so that hospitals and healthcare workers can decrease the occurrence of hospital-acquired infections. Our patent-pending NanoRad technology is a safe, spray-applied residual disinfectant that lasts on hard surfaces for up to a week and can kill viruses and bacteria in about 15 minutes as they land on that surface. NanoRad has the potential to drastically reduce hospital-acquired infections, which affects one in 30 patients in the US. In space, bacteria and viruses are really difficult to get rid of um, and can cause problems. 
So if you're interested in how to keep people healthier in space or here on Earth, please join us in our breakout room. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan Cousins, co-founder and CEO of Critical. Uh, we're an embedded systems company running uh, high performance, low size, weight, and power solutions for uh, remote sensing and communications technologies. Um, we're in the process of developing a, a, a radiation tolerant high bandwidth space mesh router uh, for use in low Earth, low Earth orbit satellites um, with uh, in conjunction with AFRL and looking forward to submitting our application to the uh, Mass Challenge and ISSNL um, commercialization uh, proposal in a, about a week. And yeah, looking forward to anyone who's interested in uh, talking about um, low size, weight and power, edge compute and communications platforms for space. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Khaled, uh, co-founder and CEO of Labs Cubed. Uh, at Labs Cubed, we help create, uh, we help companies create new materials, uh, specifically around the polymer industry. So rubbers, plastics, adhesives, and we achieve, it, we achieve this by uh, producing automated test equipment. So we take a lot of manual testing that's done today and automate it. So we make it much faster, much more accurate, much more consistent. Both meetings, maybe. Thank you. Hi all, my name is Vasil Apostolos. I'm the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Magos, and our solution is coming to revolutionize the virtual training and simulation applications, enabling trainees to interact via their fingers within digital environments. So imagine, for example, an astronaut or pilot trainee who could interact naturally utilizing their fingers instead of holding a pair of virtual reality touch controllers with every virtual object and equipment inside a virtual space station or cockpit. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, at Menos Robotics, we're developing a new type of uh, muscle activity sensor by measuring local blood flow changes. Our technology's primary application is to detect user intent expressed via hand gestures. So in space, this may enable astronauts to more intuitively control various equipment and tools to perform tasks such as remote maintenance and sample collection. And the data our sensor collects can also be used to track muscle usage and fatigue in space. So please come with us in our uh, breakout room. Thanks. Hi, me Bronze aims at developing the tiniest and most powerful propulsion system for satellites, the carriers, launcher stage, and extra atmospheric drones. The system, patent filed in 49 countries, permits to accomplish maneuvers such as orbit changing much faster than the competition, speeding up the operativity and increasing the security of high value assets. Thank you. All right, so we're about halfway through. Um, we really run the gamut here. I don't know if you're keeping track at home. Again, we didn't hand out bingo cards ahead of time. Maybe we should have. But um, I'm here in robotics, AI, edge computing, health tech. I mean, we're hitting all the uh, all the big trends. I don't I don't know that we've got uh, blockchain or gaming just yet, but maybe we'll get there before this whole thing's done. Um, all right, so next up, um, we're going to have a conversation with old friend uh, and uh, sage professor. I don't know how else to uh, introduce this guy. He's literally the smartest guy I know when it comes to space. Um, his, uh, his bio is there. Um, Steven spent a lot of time at NASA, is now over at Seldor uh, Capital. Um, but to me, Steven's always the guy in the room that will not say anything in a meeting until the very end. And then whatever, the one sentence that comes out of his mouth is so profound that it completely changes the direction that your company's going in uh, or your entire life. So that, that's what I know him as, is the sage. Um, so Steven, welcome, man. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks, John. That was way too kind. I appreciate that introduction. And it's been a wonderful uh, um, change in the world with you. So thank you. Awesome. So um, wh why don't we start here? Why, why don't you give us a little bit of a better background than what I just gave? Some, something that actually makes sense would be helpful, maybe. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, John. So as he, John said, 32 years at NASA, um, decided to transition out of that last summer. Um, during the last half dozen years at NASA, spent my time working with startups around the country and around the world, uh, seeding technologies with um, inside of startups with um, using NASA technologies helping to launch companies in New York City and down in Brownsville, Texas, and Puerto Rico, in um, New Mexico, Boise, Idaho, actually did some work also in Italy um, with, uh, with 
uh, space startups and connecting them with NASA technology. And so left NASA to, to look at what more I can do with uh, a startup ecosystem and uh, with the activity that I was doing in New York with a group called New York Space Alliance and moving technologies out there. The founder, um, City Nakahoto, launched last year Seldor Capital, a new venture fund focusing on space companies, as well as those companies that will take space technologies and address the United Nations Sustainability Goal. So as John said at the very beginning when he was introducing the, the cohort of space companies and the uniqueness that JSC has and the NAS and Houston has, and being able to identify companies that have a dual use that take technology that were originally intended for space and being able to use them to transform life here on earth. And so uh, Seldor provides a unique um, focus area to be able to support those companies that are trying to break into those two worlds. And in the process doing a bunch of other consulting around, around the community startup ecosystems around the US and across the globe. Awesome. Uh, this is much better than what I gave. Well done. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> um, so, all right. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and I know it's going to be a quick one um, and there's probably a lot to cover here, more, more than we'll have a chance to get through. So first off, as a plug, uh, Stephen's been a great support of our program from the beginning. So for the founders that are on, if we need to connect further afterwards, happy to do so. I'm just going to offer that up for him because I know he wants it. By the way, I keep looking over here because I think you're right here in my box. I hope that's the thing for you. If not, it just looks weird. Um, all right. So You've got a super interesting perspective. You were inside the machine of NASA for over three decades, um, and now you're on the outside um, with, as, with a venture capital firm, still on the same mission, right? Spinning technology out, advancing technology in various ways. Um, give us a sense of, of one, like how your perspective has changed going from NASA to the capital markets. Um, let's start with that, right? Or any interesting sort of trends you see there? Um, so first is, um, you know, what is wonderful to see, what, what excited me to move out is the innovation and the willingness to push boundaries in ways that NASA as a government organization could not do. And so a lot of the startups that we're working with are focusing on frontiers and new markets that had never even been in the, um, the sites of NASA. Um, there are people that are looking at the moon and being able to provide commercial services on the moon and services for earth industries on the moon, which is something that NASA had never considered when it created the commercial lunar payload um, services um, program that Megan had mentioned earlier. So for me, the biggest uh, transformation and the biggest opportunity is startups knowing, not knowing what they don't know, being able to be willing to, to take those risks and now the funding being available to, to make that happen. That's awesome. Um, so we, we were talking a little bit earlier um, and, and you had something that was insightful I'm hoping you can share a little bit. So um, uh, you have a really unique perspective on how you think about the space industry and the space commercialization industry and in, in, um, sort of broadly. Um, I don't know a better way to ask, but can you just kind of walk us through that thought process a little bit? I'd love for you to just kind of like share that view with this group. Well, thanks, John. Yes. Yeah, so, so what's interesting, whenever I started working with startups around the country, um, the first thing is that people think of space companies as just being those that provide assets in space. Um, so as Megan talked about the launch services and everything that goes up into space. And so that's one part of this uh, the spectrum of what we call entrepreneurs, space entrepreneurs. And those are the ones that provide those services in space. Um, it takes a lot more resources to do that and a lot more investment to do that. And earlier this year in the Harvard Business Review, they broke even that sector into those that are space for space economy and space for earth economy. So as Megan has showed in the picture, you got space for earth, those people that are doing the look, understanding the climate that are providing communication services. But then the other side of it, you've got the space for space, the people that are doing things on space station for manufacturing or providing the landing capabilities on the moon. So that's one sector, but the other two are the ones that I believe there's a lot of opportunities and transformation and where I see a lot of the companies from, um, in this current cohort kind of fall into which is those people that are on earth entrepreneurs that take the assets and the capability and the information from space and transform industries on here on earth. So a lot of people are using the satellite imagery and creating apps on earth to be able to support um, 
um, farmers be able to understand their irrigation, how to better um, um, irrigate their crops and to reduce the, the cost that it takes to do that. People that are helping out on mining, people that are helping out in um, with the apps be able to understand pirating that is happening in the oceans with, uh, with ships. So that whole industry that is using space information and, and integrating it and transforming it and creating markets here on earth is a whole sector that is a lot easier to break into, doesn't have require the same um, capital that you, we would require in order to go to space. So those on earth entrepreneurs are a wonderful opportunity for um, new entrepreneurs to break into. And then the third one is the place where I spent a lot of time and there's a growing capability in this and we can talk about this more in a little bit, but it is those spin-off entrepreneurs, those people that take space technology, those things that Solder is looking for and transform life here on earth. People that take um, renewable resources on space station, they have to be able to provide clean air, clean water. As the astronauts love to say, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee with their systems on, on board the space station. And those are being used back here on earth to transform economies and communities that don't have access to those resources. People that, um, there's a technology that came from Houston that provide for um, solar power refrigeration, came from a space technology, being able to provide medical supplies in communities around the world that are off the grid. So with those are typically not captured in entrepreneurs, but it does take a special community and a special connector and a special capability to be able to understand a technology that was originally intended for space and how do you transform it back here on earth. You have communities like Mass Challenge or down in South Texas, there's a group down there called Expanding Frontiers or up in, in New York, the New York Space Alliance that helps to be connectors to take space technologies to those entrepreneurs that are wanting to make a difference. And so for me, it is, the combination of those three types of entrepreneurs, those that are in space, on earth, and spin-offs that create the whole ecosystem. And most of what you saw before that making sure on the numbers, it focuses a lot on the, the first, a little bit on the second, but that whole spin-off side that may find its way back up into space eventually is uh, opportunities that uh, that is still untapped and act, but it is a growing capability that we're seeing right now in the, in the community. So, so this is fascinating, right? Um, you know, one of the things I remember um, over the years we've known each other, especially in the days at NASA when you did a lot of the spin out technology uh, work, a lot of that tended to go to universities to get further developed. Um, it, it was it seemed like it was difficult to find the right mix of an entrepreneur that was at the right stage to take that technology and go create a business out of it, right? Um, so I'm curious, one, is my perspective right on that? <laughs> am, I, am I remembering that correctly? Uh, and then two, for the, for the founders on the call here, um, that can be a sort of a big daunting thing to think about what other technology that's out there that can augment my current solution. So what advice could you give them to, to navigate that process, to know what's out there, to figure out where those opportunities are? What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. You know, NASA for years has had a um, great program to be able to spin out its technologies to the community. The challenge is that number one, entrepreneurs don't think of space technologies for their um, companies. Number two, they think that the process and the um, system to get into NASA is daunting and won't be able to go after it. And so um, in the last half dozen years, NASA launched a program called uh, um, that focused on, on being able to provide NASA technology to it was called Startup NASA to be able to provide NASA technology to the community at no cost in order to be able to make it uh, easier for entrepreneurs to be able to access the, the technology. But even with that, we found that you needed to translate. So you're right, John, that um, a lot of the time you find universities helping to make the connection. But over the last half dozen years, we've been finding those connector organizations like Expanding Frontiers, like New York Space Alliance. Down in Puerto Rico, there's a Parallel 18. Those communities that can that have a relationship that can help identify the technologies and help entrepreneurs that navigate that or host events where they'll bring curated a, a couple of dozen technologies to entrepreneurs where the entrepreneurs say, I wanna be able to do something in energy or I wanna do something in uh, medical. And those technologies are provided on the table and almost like a, a Lego building block, the um, entrepreneurs through a hackathon will be able to see what technologies fit their companies. And so for those that are wanting to look at uh, the technologies that NASA has, those are some of the places to go. But just in the last year, um, in the last couple of years, the number of people that are coming to NASA to license the technology has doubled. And three years ago, there were about 84 um, licensed um, technologies that happened throughout the agency. 
Um, this past year, it, um, it jumped up to 154. This year is on track to uh, surpass that. So there is now an understanding that you can get NASA's technology, license it, and help to, to grow your company. And it's not just technology, it's just software. Just this summer, they, there was another announcement from NASA that they made 80 uh, software applications available to entrepreneurs for free to be able to take this, this and adopt it into whatever algorithms that they may have or other processes to be able to help support the start of the company. So first place to go is NASA technology, uh, um, techtransfer.gov, and you'll be able to go from there to, to see what's potentially available. Awesome. Um, I want to dive into one other thing real, real quick before we have to wrap up. Um, so one of the, one of the challenges that we've had in the past with the space industry, we see this a lot in our safety and security track too. any of these industries where um, it, it's perceived that your primary customer is going to be the government or some, some arm of the government. Uh, it's really hard for startups to get involved in, right? It's really hard for them to a lot of times get over either the, the very real or at least the perceived barrier that it's going to take a long time to get to the right people, to get paid, to acquire a customer, and the startup may not live that long. As a result of that, too, I've, I've noticed, or, or, or at least in years past, uh, venture funds in this space have been very shy to, um, I should say venture capital in general has been very shy to invest in these startups because they're looking for quicker returns than typically what the industry can provide. So I'm super fascinated from your perspective, right? Being at a venture fund now, um, how, how do you think about that timeline, that horizon? Is it is it skewed based on the customers? Or are you seeing the customer um, in, in the government uh, moving faster? Or are you finding more maybe dual use? Like, it, it, how, do you, how do you think about that? Um, great question. I look at it three ways. First, um, about a couple months ago, I saw a presentation from a woman over at Seraphim Capital. Um, she's uh, been involved a lot in the space industry. And she addressed that one right up front, saying that um, the moderator said, oh, it takes too long for to see a return on investment on these space companies. It takes too long to exit. And she says, no, that's not the case. You know, she says, um, in, in her experience, and they've invested in a, in a large number of companies, she's seen the um, exits, especially with SPACs and some of these things, other new um, activities, being in, at this, on par with other companies, a five, six year um, horizon, we will turn to, to exit from these. So she's, she's out on a mission to debunk that perception that a space company is too long of an investment to, to turn around. The second part of that is that when we started first working together, John, it was the world of government that was the primary customer. Since I've gotten out and looking at a lot of the, the business models for some of these companies, they're really focusing on commercial markets. The one on the moon that uh, is a stealth company, hopefully we'll be able to announce it in the next couple of months, but is actually has a really strong business case for a business model that uses, that supports um, industries here on earth. It is not looking for the government to be the, the um, provider for this, the funding. It's not looking for the government to provide the services to be able to get up there in the infrastructure. It has a business model that is completely commercial. So. Yes, five, six years ago, that was the case that most of the uh, primary customers were the government, but we're seeing more and more of these space companies. And as I mentioned in the three different type of communities, you'll find that two out of three of them really don't have government as a primary customer. All right, we could probably keep this conversation going for another couple hours. Unfortunately, we can't on this go around, um, but I look forward to doing that very soon. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your background. Um, always good to have you on. Really, really appreciate the insight. Um, thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. This is fun. All right. Let's get to the last batch of intros, uh, and then we can get into the breakout rooms. Uh, so again, if you're following along at home, uh, the Airtable is in the chat. The Airtable, if you're watching this recording later, will be with the links. Um, always happy to help you connect further on. Um, also, if you're following along at home, again, the Zoom bingo. I don't know if you got to see my two-year-old bust in, but that, that's another first, right? So we've had a mute now and we've had a kid jump in the room. Uh, her name's Savannah. She's amazing, uh, by the way, and maybe she'll make another a visit back here in a little bit. All right, let's do some startup introductions. The uh, the list is in the chat. We're going to start with Mod Tech Labs. Alex, take it away. Thank you. So space is the endless frontier, and there are countless ways to use visual data to increase safety, accuracy, and security from satellites to 3D printing to training. 
Mod is a platform allowing any user to 3D scan and process data for accuracy and meaningful visual insights. Embedding seamlessly into existing solutions, we supercharge capture and processing using advancements from the entertainment market. We make 3D in a click for this universe and the next. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Koskov. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Natrion. We're a Binghamton, New York-based energy storage startup developing safe and high performance uh, lithium ion batteries for a number of mobility uh, in aerospace applications. So lithium batteries, of course, have kind of earned a, a reputation for themselves recently uh, due to their inherent fire safety risk uh, and also uh, performance bottlenecks. Uh, so we're resolving those by designing new solid state batteries. Uh, we're able to dramatically improve the operating temperature range of batteries, uh, diminish their uh, explosion risk from puncture damage and other fail, uh, fail cases, uh, and also improve their energy density by nearly 50%. So obviously, essentially wide range applications in space systems and reducing the size and weight uh, that must be allocated to power systems on, on spacecraft. We actually developed this technology under an Air Force uh, SBR phase one, currently working on a phase two uh, aerospace project with Special Operations Command. And we're also doing the ISS and LTEC in space uh, program through Match Challenge. So I'm really happy to be there and looking forward to networking with you all. Hi, my name is Faisal Razak. I'm with Nord Free, and uh, we are an impact company looking to deliver advanced aquaponic solutions and uh, in kind of developing areas. But in this context, we're looking to um, grow fish and crops in a closed loop system without soil, without rainfall. Uh, and that means that it gives the ability to hopefully grow food in space and beyond. And in addition to that, we're also developing a digital health monitoring system that can kind of regulate and monitor that all the time using an array of advanced sensors. Thanks. My name is Heather Decker. I am CTO and co-founder of Roanoke. We are a biotech company that specializes in creating next generation 3D cell expansion technologies for the life sciences. We have recently applied that same technology to develop a new way to grow plants, one where the plant can control its water absorption and nutrient uptake all without the need of soil or a hydroponic system. We believe a crucial aspect of further space travel and commercialization will be the ability to be self-sustaining, especially when it comes to food and agriculture. Uh, research scientists and clinical professionals have acknowledged that astronauts' mental health is impacted in outer space. Safe for HIPAA compliant interactive multifunctional communication platform can empower astronauts to organize their care through ease of communication, data collection, curated very personalized content, and collaboration with their clinical professionals, their treaters, their family members, and other support networks in, in one location. Safe Surfer can help astronauts and their families optimize their physical and mental health. Please connect us in the breakout room to learn more. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Georgia Grace. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of She Fly Apparel, where we are on a mission to help everyone answer nature's call literally. We do that through a second patented zipper uh, so that women can use the bathroom outside without exposing skin to the elements or other people. And similar to what Megan said, we were originally invented for outdoor recreation here on earth, but we're really excited about expanding this technology into all imaginable imaginable pairs of pants and uniforms for women and everyone in space and beyond. Hello, um, Therapeutic Vision is developing drugs for animals and humans. Our topical aldose reductase inhibitor, Kinestat, has been given FDA provisional approval for preventing cataracts in diabetic dogs. Our topical antioxidant formulation is licensed as Optics Care Eye Health for treating dry eye in animals. And we are preclinically developing neuroprotective multifunctional redox modulators, which are a new class of drugs for preventing, protecting vision, hearing, and brain functions in our aging population, military, and space explorers. Hi, I'm Neil from V Rotors, a platform for enabling massively scalable oversight and control of robotics in space. Uh, distributed teams, whether astronauts on the space station or the Lunar Gateway, together with ground operators engage collaboratively with robotics using their PC or VR headset. 
Uh, we do this today with terrestrial remote drone and robotics programs like the XPRIZE Avatar competition. Uh, we'll have a video playing in our breakout room. Please join us. Thank you.